Side Hustle Show 229, how a part-time podcast turned into multiple streams of income and a full-time business. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because hustlers control what they can control. Today's episode is a great example of taking control of what you can in your life. A few years ago, Steve Young, not the 49ers quarterback, although he is a neighbor of mine here in the Bay Area, was building apps in his spare time and making a little bit of extra money doing that. But things started to change for the better, both on the app side and on the broader, unforeseen at that point, business side, when Steve started a podcast to talk to other app developers. Today, the App Masters podcast at appmasters.co has more than 500 episodes, and I invited Steve on the show to share how he took this part-time project and built it into a full-time business with multiple streams of income. Stay tuned to hear how he marketed the show in its early days and how he's been able to sell consulting packages, digital products, sponsorships, private masterminds, and even a live event because of it. I love this conversation because first, there's a lot of parallels between what I'm doing and what Steve's done. And second, because he presents a straightforward way to build a business, not by starting out as an expert yourself, but by becoming one over time. Notes, links, and a free PDF download with all of Steve's top tips from this episode are at sidehustlenation.com slash Steve Young. All one word on that one. Before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, FreshBooks.com. FreshBooks is the affordable small business accounting software for side hustlers and freelancers with invoicing and time tracking built right in. After you follow Steve's advice on getting customers, you're going to need a way to get paid. So get started with your 30-day free trial at FreshBooks.com slash side hustle. I'll be back to tell you a little bit more about FreshBooks, plus my top takeaways from this chat with Steve after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. Man, it was brutal. I was still at a full-time job working for a startup in San Francisco, and I would just record any which way I could. So like lunch breaks, I literally remember the Stitcher studios were right above the floor of ours. And I had somebody who was in town for another conference said, Hey, do you want to record at like 12? I could take my lunch break and then we'll record at Stitcher. And we did that. And so that was one of the things I would record at late at night. It was just something I was very passionate about. I just want to learn more about the app space. And so finally figured out that, Hey, this is what I want to do. And just really try to plan out that 8 to 9 p.m. would be my recording time and just started hustling my butt off to start recording episodes. And Nick, I wanted to, before I was starting, I heard somebody else was like, hey, if you want us to launch a podcast, you got to be a little bit different. So I was like, because I was thinking just once a week, I was like, it was manageable. Then somebody's like, yeah, you should do twice a week. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Evan, let's go. (laughs) Let's go twice a week. So I did twice a week in the beginning days. So you, that's awesome that the Stitcher offices were right above yours and you could use their, they let you use their facility. That's pretty sweet. Did you, were you recording interviews like late at night or was those, those mostly solo shows? No, they were all interviews. So I did no solo shows in the beginning. It was okay. all interviews. And the, I think in the beginning for me, it was really hard to get guests because you're just starting to ramp up. Like, yeah, I don't want to go after the big names yet. I wanted a little bit under my belt before I just went after the bigger names. And so just to give your listeners an actionable tip, I used a site called Haro, help a reporter out. And I used it under my company, my previous company umbrella, because I didn't have traffic. Like you have to have a million Alexa ranking at least. So you can't be a brand new site. So I used it under a different brand. And I just said, Hey, I'm looking for app developers interview. I got a few people interested. And that gave me like five or 10 interviews to start off with. So I'd record like 6am in the morning, depending on if they're in the East coast or in the UK, like other countries, 6am would be perfect. Or I would do like eight or 9pm at night figuring out how to get it done. Did that ever come back to bite you? Like the company was like, Hey, we never got any press from this company or what? Maybe after the, the, no, they knew actually they knew, they knew that it was something different because they knew right off like, Hey, this doesn't make sense. It was a completely different company from okay. why would they do an app one? And so, yeah, it's just kind of like your foot in the door to get accepted as a, as a reporter on helper reporter. Exactly. I've already used them for other services. So I had that account and I think I tried to use it under my new, App Masters brand, it just didn't work. Like, hey, your site's brand new, it doesn't work. And so I was like, all right, let me try to figure out this way. Yeah, I like using it as a source too, but yeah, not gonna be able to do it if you're brand new. I think you're right, the one million, top million sites in Alexa or something is a weird, weird requirement, but that's how it goes. <laughs> Although I think, I don't know, I feel like I've used it for a book or something and maybe you don't have to, they'll like, they'll wave that or something. But anyways, what do you think? So this is like 2013. What's driving the growth of the show at this point? So you're putting out two episodes a week, hustling like crazy to record this stuff. What's the listenership like? What is what does that look like in terms of traction? Yeah, it was it was good. So we hit the new and noteworthy. I didn't I had no idea how to launch a podcast. So I knew I wanted 
I think three or four in the bank. And so I just launched it with, I think three, it was like episode zero, which was a little bit just me saying, here's what the podcast is going to be about. And then one, two, what I did was kind of figure out like ways to get people to share it. So right off the bat, we hit about two to 300 downloads per episode. I was like, all right, wow. that's decent. Like not too bad. And what I did to grow that list was one of my past guests, like I was maybe interview one or two. I said, Hey, would you mind emailing your email list and letting them know about the podcast? He actually used this tactic. I read about this tactic through his magazine, how he grew his magazine. So I went, Hey, I read your tactic <laughs> and would you do this for me? And it was harder for him to say no, because obviously he used it for somebody else. And so he's yeah. like, sure. And that like, boom, grew the episode, like his episode alone went through the roof. It was like number one for a long time. And then later on, what I did was because I'm sort of like a hacker, I scraped Google Play because I'm in the app space and Google Play gives the email addresses of all the developers. And so I scraped that site to just get all the email addresses. And when I interviewed the co-founder Shazam, that was like my first big interview, I said, all right, I want to promote this like crap. So I would just cold email all like 300 app developers and say, hey, I want nothing from you. Just check out this great episode that I did with the co-founder of Shazam. And that's all I did. Okay. That's very specific to your audience, but I like this <laughs> uh, methodology of like, look, I'm going to do with this one-on-one -on -one outreach, trying to get one listener at a time with the hopes that they'll become a fan and maybe share it. Yeah. I mean, I think right now, like I still use Facebook groups. So to this day, if people are listening to the show, they're trying to grow their listenership. I use Facebook groups. There's a big app entrepreneur Facebook group that I'm part of, 20,000 members. And I always, when there's a big time guest on, I say, hey, man, this, you got to check this out. It's a really good interview. Okay. And they're cool with you posting the link in those groups? You got to build up the equity. You can't, that wasn't the first thing I did, right? So I built up a little bit of equity after a while, but then, yeah, now I can do that and they're able to do it because a lot of the admins know me already. And so they'll, they'll let it slide. No, I like that. And I like even going through questions in Facebook groups. And if it's like, you have an episode related to that question, you can try and answer it in text as best you can, but Hey, for more information on that, I just did this whole episode on it. <laughs> and what's, what else is cool is like anyone else on that thread, if they still have the notifications turned on, also going to see that post. So there's some fun stuff you can do in the Facebook groups. Okay. So I'm asking guests to share, not just on social media, but through their email list. I love that cold emailing, doing the direct one-on-one -on -one outreach. That sounds really similar to what I was doing in the early days of the side hustle show. I launched with an email list of 11 and it was entirely friends and family at that time. So I went through my gmail contacts so i had like you know five or seven years of actually probably a little bit more of gmail at that time and just like looked at their like suggest feature so i type like a and see what emails would pop up and then like <laughs> a a a b and they'll just go down like oh i haven't talked to this person in a while hey you want to come check out my podcast and of course now it's super embarrassing because early episodes of the show i'm like oh my gosh i asked my closest like friends and contacts to listen to this stuff and download it but that's kind of what you got to do to get it off get it off the ground yeah. Do you think new and noteworthy exposure got you? Was that worth anything to you? Or is that just like something only podcasters pay attention to? I don't know. I think that it's only something podcasters only pay attention to. I know when I first discovered podcasts, I usually look at the top charts and just kind of look at that rather than new and noteworthy. I do remember like one time over the weekend, I don't know, some bump hit where I made it to like number two under tech and software or something. That's the category that I was under. Okay. And I took that screenshot. I was like, holy cow, like I made it. <laughs> <laughs> but then still it was like two, 300 downloads an episode. It wasn't like huge amounts of downloads. Right. So are you doing anything on air to drive subscribers, to drive email signups, to get people back to your website? Is it purely a podcast play at this time? It was purely a podcast play. I was only focused on learning about the space. I went to the mindset of like not thinking that this was going to be the vehicle that was going to set me free into entrepreneurship. I just said, hey, I have an app business that I started in 2011 and it's been something I've been doing on the side. I want to turn this into a real business. So could I learn from others and really use that knowledge to turn it into a legitimate business. So I just started executing. And then once I started getting some wins, I would share some of those wins with the audience. But in the beginning, it was just purely like for that first three months, I just wanted to learn. I wanted to get big guests and I was just purely focused on getting bigger guests so that I could learn from them and also like obviously grow the audience. But yeah, that's all I was focused on is learning. Tell me about like pitching big guests as, as a new podcaster. What was that? 
like was that was that stressful for you was that were people like no who are you i don't i don't have time for you or what totally like they all said that like a lot of the bigger ones so i remember pitching the co-founder shazam i was like hey you know i have this podcast i think at the time i was i don't even make the pitch of don't remember exactly what i said but i just said hey i have this podcast would love to have you on this podcast you know i think i'm 30 plus episodes in and so forth and he didn't respond to that first email i followed up over the weekend i was like hey chris can you please come on and yeah please let me interview you say steve why don't we talk on monday like here's my cell phone number let's talk on monday and i remember at the time he was like okay steve you know like how big is the listenership i was like you know it was 300 i was like yeah three to six (laughs) hundred right (laughs) and then he's like all right that sounds good well let me talk to the shazam pr team and then let's see if it works and i was like cool and then he said yeah let's do it right after that though i was in talks with like yahoo developer and all these other bigger guests I just went back and, hey, Chris from Shazam is coming on. Do you want to come on? And he says, yes. And so it was just snowball effect. I remember getting, I don't know if people use this tweet bot, tap bot guys. They're really big. It's a big Twitter client. But that guy, like I tweeted at him and I said, hey, do you want to come on? Please, please, please. He finally said yes. And then went back to people who had said no earlier. I said, hey, tweet bot's coming on. Do you want to come on? And this was the guy who made clear the to-do list app. And he said, yeah, sure. So I was trying to leverage other people's names. Once they got the yes from somebody else, I went back to a earlier no and said, Hey, this yes is coming on. Do you want to now come on? And they usually say yes. Yeah. That, that, I don't know. I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but like that works well in, in cold pitches that, that I get. It's like, if you can drop a name or two that I recognize or like that I'm friends with, like then it's so much harder to say no, because it's like, well, what if that somehow comes back? Like, well, these guys said, <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's all, it's a very, it's a very tight knit community. So uh, that's, that's a cool way to, uh, to go about it. Okay. So you're still doing, and this is kind of a cool angle on it too. So you're doing apps as a side hustle and like interviewing people who are ahead of you in that space and like taking what they've learned and taking their tactics, applying that to your own business. Now, did you see the app side of the business grow during, during these early years? Oh yeah, definitely. Like people, I built up a little bit of listenership and they're like, Hey, you know, here's how you do ASO, which is app store SEO. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Like I've actually learned a lot of this and I use some of the, the tools that people are recommending on the podcast to then use it on my apps. And like, I literally doubled downloads for my, one of my apps. It was a paid app too. So it was like phenomenal. It's like, oh my goodness, this is actually working and we're doing really well. And so, yeah, all this stuff was really working after a while. And I would try different PR strategies. So I remember launching an app and the PR strategy. Somebody told me, I was like, try the exclusive, give a big publication, the exclusive of, exclusive on the launch. I was like, perfect. Let me try that. And so I tried it and then it worked. I got on the next web for one of my apps. And so it was, everything was working, just learning from people. I love it. I've, I've done the same thing with dozens of side hustle show guests. Like, <laughs> oh, shoot, I should totally apply that. And uh, it's a very, it's a cool way and almost it's like selfish in a way because it's like, well, I want to learn and, and selfless in a way because you're sharing it with everybody else. So I really like that. Okay. So the apps, kind of the self-develop, are you developing themselves or are you hiring developers? In the beginning, it was all me. So I still, I still made a bunch of the, the apps. I stopped after I started the podcast, but yeah, most of the apps I was starting to trying to learn from and grow the downloads for them, I made them all by myself. Okay. So that's one way that the business is is ringing the cash register, is making money. What else is is monetization? <laughs> like, is, are you taking sponsors on the podcast at this point or what, what else is going on? No, not yet. So this is probably like four months into starting the podcast. Somebody reached out to me who was, who was listening to the show he was like an early listener and he said, Hey, Steve, you know, I work for a bigger company. Can we hire you to consult and launch our new app? I was like, okay. Like I didn't know, I wasn't very confident in my art marketing skills. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, sure. Let's talk. And obviously I did a little bit of PR with my startup job. And so I was like, okay, well, I know a little bit of PR. Here's what I would do. I'll reach out to PR publications and then we can figure all this out. And so we put a package together and no, I had no idea how to price this either. So I was just like, you know, like what, what kind of budget are you working with? Luckily I built up so much equity with this guy. He was just like, you know, another company charged was quoting us 15,000. And I was like, okay, well I could do it for five then. Right. Like I was, <laughs> I was like, let's, let's do it for five and let, let's figure this out. Wow. Okay. So slow down. So you, okay, you yeah. asked him that question. Well, what's your, what's your budget like? And you got yeah. him to name a number first. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Yeah. Cause it's like, well, shoot 15 grand. 
versus like, oh yeah, I'll I'll do it for 250 bucks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> people won't tell me i was like now when i ask that question people are like no i know what you're trying to do here you're trying to get me to name a price so that you can i'm like no like really like now i feel comfortable and i have a little bit but i would just say look i just want to make sure we're in the same ballpark okay if we're completely off are you thinking a few thousand or are you thinking tens of thousand and i would just start off with that to get them the same number but he luckily i think it was because he was listening to the show and we built up a little bit of a relationship just because he was listening, that he was willing to be a little bit more honest with me. Because he wanted me to have this job too. I think he was pulling for me. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. So that's four months in. Yeah. How long were you doing it before you quit your job and, and said, I'm going to be a full-time, I'm going to be the full-time app master? Yeah, right. It was called Mobile App Chat, Nick, back in the day. And I was like, oh, this is a horrible name. <laughs> like, it, it's pretty bad. I can pick your old uh, iTunes cover art. Yeah, yeah, it, it was really bad. So we, it was probably four months in, I was like, oh, cool. And then probably a couple of months after that, I got a referral from somebody else that said, hey, this guy's looking for an app launch help with some of the PR side. And I was like, cool, like I can do it. And we charged 3000 for that. So it's starting to build up a little bit of relationship there. And then I would say probably, we started in May, around November, probably September timeframe, I made the commitment. So I joined John EO Fire's mastermind. And I was like, oh, I got to do that. And I joined in July. Through that, I started noticing that people were putting setting dates. And they're like, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, leaving. These are all side hustlers. Okay, okay. Yeah, and they said, I'm leaving. And I was like, holy crap, I want to do that. And so something triggered my brain. I said, all right, end of this year, I'm leaving. And then I started building the blogs to get there. So first thing, I hired a coach like that I met through the EO Fire mastermind. And then second thing, I talked to John. I was like, hey, John, like, how do I get sponsorships? So he sent me a little one sheeter that he uses. And so I started reaching out. I had a 99 designs contact already because of my previous job. And I said, hey, do you, who's, who's the podcast sponsorship? I know you guys do a lot of that. Would you get me in touch? And she got me in touch. And I started making $500 a month through 99 designs, that sponsorship. Nice. And then my earlier, like one of my earlier guests through a referral, he was looking for marketing help too. So things were just starting to fall into place. He was looking for marketing help. I said, I can help you with that. Like, I'm pretty good with content marketing. Here's what I'll do. And so he's like, all right, let's do it. And I was like, I'm leaving at the end of this year. Do you want to kind of work together? So he's like, yeah. So we signed a look, a contract together where I was just going to help him with content marketing and consulting and all that stuff. Then I was going to bring half my revenue, pretty much make up for the, it's probably leaving a hundred. I was making about 125, 120 a year. I was leaving that on the table, but I was like, if I can hit 10 grand a year or a month, that'd be great. Yeah. So he's bringing about half of that. And then the rest, I felt like I could make up with everything else I, I was doing, like digital products, consulting. And I started my own mastermind just because I love John's mastermind. I was like, this is freaking brilliant, right? Like I have to do my own just for the app space. And so I got 10 people to join that mastermind as I was starting to leave. So I just started putting blocks together, preparing to leave. Okay. So this is kind of like summer 2014 timeframe. No, this is 13. This is 13. Yeah. So seven months after starting the podcast, I ended up leaving. Okay. For the consulting stuff, did you start advertising that on the show saying like, Hey, by the way, I'm available for this content marketing stuff or this PR stuff, or did it just kind of naturally people started reaching out to you? No, it was just natural. I don't, I didn't do anything. I was against consulting. I was just like, no, this is dumb. The thought in my head was I was going to make courses and I was going to do apps. And that was it. That was the thought in my head as I was leaving. Like, that's how I'm going to make my revenues. Because it's time leveraged, right? Right. Exactly. That's what you always hear, right? Like, you got to leverage your time. You can't trade dollars for hours, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to do consulting. It just helped out that this guy was looking for consulting help. I was like, hey, that's revenue right there. And as I start building my digital products, then that will help out a little bit. And I was like, perfect. So it was that. But consulting, I... I turned a blind eye to. Okay. So, and did you end up building courses like kind of on the back of all the knowledge that you learned and, and all the knowledge that your guests shared to compile that stuff? Yep, I did. I did that. I did. It was called the awesome app launch course. I, tried, I was okay. trying to sell it for $500. It was like PR. Oh my God. Like if I look back on it now, this is 2014. I thought this was going to be half my revenues, right? I was doing webinars on a weekly basis and I was just trying to do like, you know, the JLD model is just like, get it out there, get it out there, constantly do webinars and promote this course. If I'm honest, like that course was junk. If I think about it, I was trying to monetize too early from that. Okay. Looking back on it, because all we do right now, consulting, right? We're an agency. 
looking back on it, I would have probably doubled down on the consulting side, learn a little bit more because we know so much more. And if I had to recreate that course today, my God, like the content would be so killer. Whereas the content back then was just like, oh, come on, like really, this is, this is stuff that is like very beginner oriented, but the, the content I could create now, it's so, would be so much better. Did you sell any of those or you think you'll revisit it? I did. And I might, I might, I mean, I would say about 10 or 20, 15% of our revenues from courses. And so I do smaller courses that just show like mini courses. How do you do one thing, sell them for around a hundred bucks. And that does pretty well. So right now we're trying to figure out like what the, what's the right funnel, right? You know, give them a free course and then maybe a smaller course. And then maybe it's a big, bigger consulting package. So trying to okay. figure out that funnel. I love having these courses, but I think I would have just started off with maybe a smaller, lower price course that just teaches the one thing I know pretty well. And maybe if I look back on it, that would have been just PR because that's all I really knew really well back then. And I would have just taught that maybe sold it for a hundred bucks then rather than trying to sell like 500. So I saw everybody else selling for like $500,000. I was like, Oh, okay. I want to do that. Yeah. It just wasn't while I sold maybe like 10 or 20, it just wasn't enough to live off of. So. Okay. Yeah. Double down on, on what's working, but cool to try it out. Are you advertising those on the podcast or like, how are people hearing about those? Do they just come to your site or they sign up for your email list? How does that work? Yeah, they had, so I was at the time, I think I started to build up an email list of maybe a thousand or 2000 and I would just promote the webinars through there and then I would sell them on the webinars. And then, so that was pretty much how I was selling it. And I think I started putting it on the website, like, Hey, here's my awesome app launch course. If you want to check it out, it's you know $500, go check it out there. Okay. Were you also like blogging at that time? Cause it can be hard to get podcast listeners, get you out of their earbuds and, and onto your back onto your website, back onto your email list. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest part of podcasting is like, it's very slow to build up your email list. Whereas the written word I think can reach a way bigger audience than the, the spoken word. And so I was probably blogging a little bit. I'm not, I wasn't as big time blogger as I probably am a little bit more today, but it wasn't much, man. It was just, I would say it was complete failure trying to do that course. Like it was just, we were trying to promote the crap out of it through webinars, cross promoting with other people. So I reached out to some of my friends who had a big email list. Hey, let's set up an affiliate deal. I was trying to do anything to make this course a success. And it just was like a major flop in my eye. We made money, but it was just nothing to live off of. It was just like a good, yeah. I mean, maybe a few thousand probably hit 5,000 for the life of it. It just wasn't that good. Yeah. What were you doing to get listeners to join that email list to build that first thousand, 2000 subscribers? So I would take one of the first things I did was I took one of the webinars that I was presenting on and I just share that as a free giveaway. So I took the webinar, did the webinar knowing that this would become a free giveaway and I would pause at certain parts knowing that that would be edit points. And then I just gave that away as a free course for signing up for my email list. And that did really well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was kind of, that was the lead magnet and you could promote that on air. Yep. Tell me more about the sponsor. So 99 designs was the first sponsor. Did you do yeah. some more proactive outreach to find, to find others? Yeah. So some other ones started coming through. He was like, Hey, I heard of your podcast. Can I sponsor? So I ended up like probably October time frame, So about, was it six months, five, six months, seven months after starting the podcast, I was getting two sponsors on my podcast. And I was making about a thousand a month, both through both of them. So I was like, Hey, I got $500 a month. And this guy stayed on for a while and 99 design stayed on for a while too. So they were a good income stream for the next year. It was just like a thousand guaranteed. So I didn't do too much outreach. It was just people heard about it. 99 designs was like probably the whole 2014, much of it. They were a podcast sponsor. Yeah, that's great. Shoot, it was like years before I got that kind of money for sponsorship. So you must be doing something right. <laughs> I'm not sure, my friend. I'm not sure. <laughs> Just being cheap. <laughs> Tell me about the mastermind. So yeah. this is kind of modeled after the now defunct Fire Nation elite. But what's uh, tell me a little bit about how you priced and sold and kind of structured that. So in the beginning, I went sort of like the EO Fire model. I was like, okay, well, it's 300 bucks per quarter. If you want to join in the beginning, one of the things I did best was my small audience, you know, around Christmas time, I didn't do this on purpose, but I, it just happened to be around Christmas time. But I was like, Oh, why don't I just get 
as a way of giving back to the audience, I emailed them and say, Hey, do you want to let me interview you? I want to talk to the people in the audience. And then a few people responded and say, Hey, yeah, I'd love to come on and be interviewed. And I was like, perfect. You know, let's set up a time to talk. And th their episodes launched around the Christmas time. So I was really trying to engage with the small audience I already had. What happened was that when I was launching the mastermind, so I'm launching this, it's coming out January, 2014. Here's what's involved. We're going to have a private Facebook group. We're going to meet on a monthly basis and we're just going to talk and kind of, kind of have a virtual hangout. So I priced it at about 300 bucks a quarter and then launched it. I said, like, I'm only looking for 10. That's all I want in the beginning. So we got 10, you know, that was a good, what, $3,000 right into a bank account. I was like, perfect, cool. I really believe in this. Let's, let's do it. So we started doing it. And then that, the end of that quarter, one guy left and said, Hey, it's not a good fit for me. I was like, well, this is not cool. Like, I don't, you know, like I like everybody. I don't want anybody to leave. <laughs> right. And so I was like, Hey, for those nine who renewed, like a nine, it's still a 90% retention rate is awesome. Nice. But I, I wanted a hundred. Like I didn't want, I really didn't want anybody to leave. Like this is my thought process. Like I really want people to stay. Like we want, I want to build relationships that are like long lasting. So I'm not here to just, uh, just to make a quick buck from you. So I said, Let's cancel everything. Let's just do lifetime membership. Boom, done. Because I really hate people leaving. So I was like, okay, that's how I sort of did that. So yeah, we got nine people that stayed. And I said, hey, cancel everything else. Let's do a lifetime thing. And that's how I slowly built up the mastermind. We now have over 70 plus members and the price is a little bit higher and there's more requirements. But early on, that's how I started. I was just looking for 10 and I launched the next quarter. And I was looking for another 10 and I just slowly started building 10 at a time, 10 at a time. Okay. What's the lifetime membership price? Right now it's 1500, a thousand for a year. And then I think I, I still have a quarterly one that's 325. So I don't mind it now because I have people, right? I, the last thing I want is if you have 10 and you get people leaving, let's say worst case scenario, I got like nine people leaving or th that's just embarrassing, right? So in the beginning, I just wanted to build that foundation. Now that I have that foundation, you know, it doesn't hurt me as much when people leave. If it's not yeah. a good fit, it's not a good fit, but I need that foundation to get that comfort level. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, I like kind of a cool different, different price tiers there. And the, your involvement is monitoring this, this Facebook group, kind of engaging that community. And then what's the, in the one-on-one -on -one or the hangout time or group, I guess, a group coaching call or group Q and A session. Yeah. So the format has changed. It was before it was like, everybody would talk about what are, what's working, talk about their problems. I kind of went off the, you know, the hot seat format of everything else. And then it's transpired into what now we do is, and I think this is really working, is meet together, limited to five or six every month. If you want to join, you know, you got to reserve the spot. We join together. We share one thing that's working in our business and one thing we want feedback on. Because I started noticing that we would do these hot seats and we'd have these sprints. None of that was really working that well. But now I say one thing that's working and one thing you want feedback on. Otherwise, don't join. Because a lot of times people will join and just not ask for help for anything. I think that's kind of lame. So I was like, okay, you got to come with something you want feedback on. And I think that's the best iteration so far. And that's once a month? That's just once a month. Yeah, virtual. It's just once a month. Don't miss it, man. Okay. Yeah. No, I love doing it though. So I get together about once a quarter with a few mastermind members that live close to me. And we just talk about business. That's more hot seat style. Hey, here's what I'm working on. I want feedback from the group. I have a whole format that I just did this at our live event. I have this whole format where I just say, okay, seven minutes, business, your business, 18 minutes, it's the rest of the group talking. And then last five minutes, you like really quick last thoughts. Like you can't talk that much. It's just last thoughts from everybody. So everybody at the table gets a chance to talk. And that's the best iteration that I've seen that's more in person that works really well. Virtual, I found that, you know, cause I want to keep it at one hour. One thing that's working, one thing you want feedback on Okay, is best. Yeah. And so even when you have 70 members, not all of them are going to be live on the call at one time, but at least that it gives you some structure for it where everybody feels like they can, they can chat. Yeah. And I like the one thing that's working for them because then people start sharing, like they want to share. Right. And so I was like, Oh, this is so great. Like this is working. I didn't know that. And then we started executing on that as a group and like, Oh, that, that's working back for us. So yeah, I like that model. Uh, what are you using for the live calls? Zoom. Love zoom. Cool. Now this is helpful. I'm thinking of kind of brainstorm, reimagining, restructuring the side hustle nation mastermind. So there's, this is, this is helpful for me too. Like, like we talked about earlier, stealing, stealing <laughs> guests ideas and, and implementing them on your own. 
Okay, so that's so we covered several different income streams: the apps, the sponsorships, the consulting, the mastermind, the the digital products, which you know we're kind of in, in a restructuring phase there. And then <laughs> recently, you did a live event, your first live yeah. event in Vegas. Can you tell me about how that was structured and how you sold that? Dude, this almost killed me. Like I was talking to a friend of mine who like who said my first live event almost killed me. And I feel the same way. So this was our second time doing it. We did one last year, but it wasn't the thing that I really envisioned. So I would call this like version 1.0. That was probably version 0.5. But the way we structured this, and so you, this is for anybody to steal. And I think the feedback I got was one of the speakers, he wasn't even talking to me. He was just walking away. And he's just like, that was the best thing I've ever done at any event. And the f day before I couldn't sleep, like I just kept tossing and turning because I thought I would look like a complete failure to all those that came. So we had about 25 people that were coming. I said, man, I really want to hit 30. Everybody knew coming in that was going to be an intimate event, but we had six tables and I, two were, we probably only need three. I was like, oh my goodness, they're just going to walk in. Like, Steve, why did you make me fly to Vegas for a glorified meetup? This is stupid, <laughs> right? We could have done this at home. We could have done this online. This is dumb. So that's, and I couldn't sleep. And I just kept thinking like, how am I going to overcome this? People are going to care. I should point this out in my opening talk, blah, blah, blah. But the way all that was gone after day, like half the day, I, I just saw people interacting like, Steve, I love this. That's so small. I love this. I love this. And all that washed away probably halfway through the first day. So day one, the way I've structured this is I wanted to feel like a normal conference and have speakers. So we do have five speakers from different various avenues, right? These are just all in the app space. Okay. Were they from the podcast or like previous guests? Yep. Previous okay. guests, people who actually paid to come. I, one, a friend of mine said, hey, he's going to come because I reached out to a friend of mine. Early on, I was like, before I even created the event bride or anything else, I reached out to 10 of my friends. I said, hey, man, I'm going to put on an event in Vegas. If I can't get 10 of my friends to come, I'm not putting it on. But here's, I think what my break even price would be. Do you want to come? Yes. So, and then I sent them the PayPal link and they just they just paid through that. That's all I did. And I just kept emailing 10 of my friends, 10 of my friends. It came out to be 30 of my friends because I got a lot of no's, <laughs> but I got like three or four people that said yes. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> but that was the best. What I found out was like the people that came were people who already knew me some shape or way or form. Yeah. Past clients, past podcast guests. I just kept reaching out and they said yes. So like email promotion worked, didn't work that much, but me reaching out one-on-one -on -one really worked. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You got to yeah, do the do the hustle, do the legwork for the first couple of events to really build that like like the like the mastermind, build that foundation. Okay. Exactly. So so speakers on on day one. Yep. And then these speakers are paying you to attend. Some of them. Some, some of them we had to pay too. Right. Some of them okay. were just friend. And I was like, hey, I need a speaker. I thought my friend would be a great speaker and he spoke. So we had a good relationship. Like I knew he wouldn't care. The other thing I did was we had every person that came to the event speak for three minutes and I kept it at three minutes. So you told a personal childhood story because I really, the whole vision of the event was making meaningful connections. So I wanted a personal angle to start off with. So they told us about a childhood story of theirs. And then in a year from now, what are we celebrating? And lastly, what is your superpower? And you had three minutes and I had a clock on the wall that gave you three minutes and it would beep. Because what I saw from version 0.5 was people will go over three minutes if you don't have a clock that everybody else sees. So that timer really helped out. People love that. They're like, you know, obviously people love talking about themselves. So people love that they were able to hear like funny personal stories and then make that connection. So it made it easier that if you go up one-on-one -on -one to somebody like, hey, that was a great personal story. I have something similar. So I just did that in between different speaker talks. Okay. And then day two was the mastermind format that I've been doing just with my close friends. The thing I kind of talked about, seven minute intro, about tables of five each. So we had about three tables. We had actually seven tables of seven. It's probably too much. So five was what I would recommend. Seven minutes, talk about your business. What are you working on? 18 minutes of just general open talking, general conversations and feedback from the group. And then the last five minutes, final thoughts from every single person at the table. Just quick one, final thoughts. Here's what I would do. Here's what I would do. And then people really, really loved that. Okay, that's for each participant, like kind of a round table, hot seat. Mm -hmm. Every participant there, every speaker there actually participated too, which was a cool thing. And then the last half of that day after we broke for lunch and then after lunch, we did a speed networking thing where you got to talk one-on-one -on -one with every single person at the event again for three minutes. And I had a clock again for three minutes. Okay. You talk, you know, and then there was a format. It's like, hey, 
what do I need or want? And then who do you know that can get me to number one, to my needs or wants? And then people were, yeah, that was the format. And then after that, we just kind of broke loose, took it easy, had a cocktail hour and everything else. Oh, last thing, Nick, I did an escape room at the end of day one. So we planned an escape room for everybody that was attending and we competed against each other with two teams because I really wanted to unite. And I think nothing unites a team or a group of people than playing a game. And that was really fun. People love that too. Sorry, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> oh, it's freaking awesome, dude. You and I have to do it. Let's go. <laughs> we live so close together. <laughs> so what is it? Okay. All right. Okay. It is so cool. All right. Your next dinner, dude, we're going to do get 20. We're doing an escape room and I'll help you plan this, but your side next side hustle thing. What you do is you get into a room that's so freaking intricate too. They tell you like for us, we were trying to break out of jail. Okay. And it looks like a jail and you have, they don't tell you anything. They just put you in a room. There are clues in the room that you have to figure out to get you to the next room. And then other clues in that next room to help you get to the next room. And man, dude, like the intricacy and the little details that they put into this is freaking amazing. And we finally got out, but so amazing. Like that was the first time I did it too. I was like, okay, well, it's right. this first time. But yeah, it was awesome. Super cool team building type of deal. Yep. That's all it was about. Cool. Did you end up breaking even on this event? I know. No. The, the imagine <laughs> the, the stress of planning something like this with people flying in from all over the country is it's kind of scary to me. Yes, it is. <laughs> so we have somebody from Germany. No, I did not break even at all. I think I probably lost a few thousand dollars on this event, but it's okay. Like for me, it's what I found out was it built confidence for my next event. So we're going to do another one in September 30 again. It took away all the fears that I had about people maybe not liking the format. Maybe it's a little bit too different. Maybe it's a little bit too small. All those fears are gone. And it gives me the confidence to be like, okay, the next one, let's try to break even. Okay. That's it. Yeah. And somebody was somebody who attended wanted to sponsor the next one too. So oh, cool. hopefully we'll break even at the next one. And then probably like three or four in, we'll start making some money. What do you charge for, for tickets for this one? 300. Okay. Most people got in for 300. A few people got in for 500 and I all felt bad. I was like, Hey, can I just refund you <laughs> the different? <laughs> well, it's kind of, because I do the same thing. Like at every conference, you're like, Oh, there's a thousand people here times $500 a ticket. And it's like, okay, these people are, they're loaded, but it's like, it's so expensive to rent event space. And then they charge you for Wi-Fi and they, all the AV stuff. It's, it's, I don't know. It's very, very tough until you build that critical mass. Right. And once you have a little bit of momentum, like we just already sold two tickets from the 25 that came, sent out an email and said, Hey, here's everybody's contact information. That was the coolest thing, Nick. Like people were like, Hey, Steve, are you going to share everybody's contact information? You know, cause they, that's all they wanted. Like, Hey, are you going to share that? Are you going to share that? Cause they wanted everybody else. They want to be connected with everybody else. And I, that was like the coolest thing to hear from other people. Like, Hey, you can share it. And they were cool with it. And I, so we shared that. And I said, Hey, I'm doing the next event. Here's the event, bright. If you want to come 299 again, it's going to be in Santa Cruz and two people bought it already. So oh, cool. really cool. Yeah. Well, Steve, this is awesome, man. Lots of, lots of fun growth hacking, hustler stuff um, <laughs> that we, we can definitely relate to. So it's appmasters.co, all the app stuff and the new copymasters.co for a cool unlimited copywriting service. Turn your audio into blog posts, especially if you're a podcaster, it might be a cool way to repurpose some of that content. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Nick, I'm going to tell you this from the bottom of my heart that the number one thing that I live through, and that's what the events, the masterminds is connecting with people. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you're side hustler, you have no idea. Cause that's what, what that was me. I was side hustling for years, like years, as far as I can remember side hustling, never knew how that entrepreneurial journey would come. All you got to do is connect. And the best way to connect, interview somebody you really admire, start learning through that whole process. And I think what I've learned through just the podcast and live events, be patient. It's going to take time, but it'll eventually get you there. You build up the name and it'll get you to that entrepreneurial journey. So I would say what I call growth hacking relationships, interview people you admire, interview them and broadcast it so that you build up the audience while you're learning at the same time. Love it, man. This is again, Steve Young from appmasters.co. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll catch up with you soon. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by FreshBooks.com. When you apply Steve's tips and begin to score more clients, you're going to want an organized and professional way to get paid. And that's where FreshBooks comes in. They know side hustlers because the whole company started as a side hustle. Today, the award-winning cloud accounting software helps entrepreneurs like us keep our paperwork in check without spending a ton of time. 
I got to tell you, it's a pretty satisfying feeling to whip up a professional looking invoice in under a minute and an even better feeling when I get that FreshBooks notification that it's been paid. So if you haven't already, check out the freshly redesigned FreshBooks platform. They've gone through feature by feature to make it more intuitive and easy to use. You can use their built-in time tracking tool to log your hours and the expense management option to organize all those receipts into legit business tax deductions. And you can do it all on the go too from the FreshBooks mobile app. See how the all-new FreshBooks can save you time dealing with your paperwork so you can spend more time making your hustle happen. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day free trial today. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle and enter the side hustle show in the how did you hear about us section. All right, my top takeaways from this chat with Steve, number one, broadcast and narrowcast. I think Steve has mastered this, putting out the show to a wide audience, but then doing the one-on-one outreach to grow the listener base and to fill his live event. It's one of those things that's, that's really kept him moving forward. He could have emailed his list and said, well, I guess nobody wants to come, but he instead he took it upon himself to personally message people he thought it would benefit. And you heard him talk about that same one-on-one hustle when it came to landing guests as well. So broadcast and narrow cast. Takeaway number two was to answer when opportunity knocks. Steve said he'd just about made up his mind. He wanted to sell apps and courses, right? Passive income products. But when a consulting gig almost fell in his lap, even though at that time he admitted he wasn't super confident because he'd never really done it before, he still knew better than to turn that one down. And today, app marketing consulting is his biggest revenue stream. And takeaway number three is to learn and execute. The podcast gave Steve an excuse to talk to some of the most successful experts in his field, but because he turned around and implemented their advice himself, he could report back to his listeners and to those guests and say, look, I tried it and this stuff really works. It's something that I do all the time, education plus action. Be sure to hit up sidehustlenation.com slash Steve Young, all one word, to download the free PDF highlight reel with all of Steve's top tips from this episode should be able to grab that through the link in the episode description of your podcast player app as well. And while you're there, if you found this episode valuable, hit the subscribe button to make sure you never miss an episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. It's actually a special four-year anniversary edition of the program in which members of the Side Hustle Nation community share the stories of their first entrepreneurial income. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.